I am so excited, not just because Christmas is less than a week away, but because I have an amazing story for you. Hallelujah. I have an amazing story for you, which is the title of my anointed message today. So let me say it again. I have an amazing story for you, which is the title of my anointed message today. Now, I want you to think about what I'm getting ready to say, okay? I want you to think about what I'm getting ready to say. Imagine with me for a moment. If you had the ability to know what your life would be like before you were born. Okay, I want you to think about that. If you had the ability, if you could see in the f future, you know, be, uh, you know, and, 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 and you knew everything about your life. Mm. Like what day and year you would be born, where you would be born, what would be your nationality, who would be your parents? Who would be your brothers and sisters? What kind of circumstances would you be born into? Would you be born uh, a rich, into a rich family, or poor family, or middle class family, or a working class family? What your occupation would be? What age you would start your occupation, and how long it would last? But here's the frightening part. Also, you would know the exact time and date that you would die. You would know it. Are y'all with me? Did I get y'all's attention? Hmm? You would know the exact, the exact time and date that you would die. And you would even know the way that you would die. It, would, it wouldn't be peaceful. But your death would be very brutal. And it would be very harsh. Oh boy, it got quiet when I said that part. Hello? Are y'all with me? And once you knew all these things beforehand, but you still had a choice as to whether you would choose that kind of life. Okay, you had the choice to change it. What would you do? You know everything that's going to happen before, before, before you even born. You know everything, and you know all the hardships and all the pain. You know everything before it's going to happen. But yet you had the power to change it. What would you do? Would you try to avoid certain things from happening? I want you all to think about it. What would you do? Well, there's somebody's story who I want to share with you today who knew all about every details about his earthly life before it even happened. He knew everything that was going to happen to him before it even happened. As a matter of fact, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 said, but when the fullness of time, when the fullness of of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Wow. You see, the date set by God the Father had arrived just as it had been planned. And everything about what Jesus would do, how he would be born, everything about Jesus was planned out. But you know what? Jesus had a choice whether to receive his life or not. 
That's right. He had a, he had a choice. He could have said, no, I don't want to do that. But he had a choice, even though he knew everything that was going to happen to him beforehand. Now, here is God made man in the flesh who was before all things. He was exalted and worshipped by all the angels. But he left all of, his, all of this glory and the riches that are related to, to redeem you and I. It was for our sake that he became poor. He was born in another man's stable. His parents offered a turtle dove as an offering after his birth, which was the offering of the poor. Because those who could afford it, they would offer a lamb. He did not have money to pay the taxes. When Jesus asked one of his disciples, you know, should we pay taxes? And he didn't even have the money to, to even pay it. And so what do you know what he had to do? He, sent, he had to send Peter to catch a fish, and the money was inside of it. Wow. He had no place to lay his head. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, the foxes have their holes, the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, it's not strange that we call ourselves Christians or we call ourselves believers and we seek to live as kings. We seek to live comfortable lives. But he who was the king of kings, he lived like a pauper. He lived like a pauper. He made his grand entry on another man's donkey. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He was in the world and the world was made by him, but the world knew him not. He gave himself to be treated poorly. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 6, it says this, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that pull out my beard. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. You know, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. He was scorned and he was mocked and jeered, this holy son of God. All of these things were happening to him. Now I want to ask you all this question. I want to ask you this question. Why would he come to receive all of this abuse by sinful men? Why would he come? He already knew what they were going to do to him. Why would he come? I asked you the question in the beginning, if, if you knew how your life was going to turn out before, and you knew that you were going to, when you were going to die, and you knew that it was going to be brutal, and you had an opportunity to change things, would you change it? But here Jesus, he knew everything that was going to happen before time, and he did not change. What an amazing story. Why would the king of the universe choose to live like this here on earth? That's the question that we would ask ourselves. If you knew that you were going to be struggled, if you knew you were going to be poor, if you knew you were going to be hurt, if you knew that you were going to be rejected, if you knew that you were going to be uh, killed brutally, why would the king of the universe choose to live like that here on earth? That's an interesting question. That's an interesting question. Why would he do something like that? The king of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of the universe. Why would he do something like that? Well, we find part of the answer in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Look what it says. 
For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, hallelujah, yet for your sake he became poor. Now, I want y'all, I want, I want y'all to say, yet for your sake. For your sake. Okay? He traded places. He traded places for your sake. He traded places for your sake. And then look what it says. Yet for your sake he became poor so that you through his poverty. You hear what it says? Through his poverty you might become rich. Wow. That blows my mind. This is why this is an amazing story. It blows my mind. In other words, though he was rich, yet for our sake, he entered into the poverty of human existence and he held absolutely nothing back, not even his own life, knowing that he would become, knowing that he would become God made man in the flesh, knowing that he would become the son of man who would have no regular place to lay his head, knowing that he would become poor in order that we may become rich. But you know what? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He chose this difficult life, this difficult life, in spite of all the difficulties. He chose it. Did y'all understand? He had a choice. He had a choice. He could have said, God, the Father, you know what? I don't think it should go down like that. Well, y'all saying, nah, you speculating. You speculating. No, I'm not speculating. Jesus had a choice when he saw everything that was going to happen. He had a choice to, what, to choose it or not. Okay, y'all don't believe me? Go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Look what it says. Look what it says. It said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, this is it. It says this. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God. But look what he said. Look what it says. Verse 7. Come on, I need y'all to read that with me. Verse 7 but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. Verse 8, and being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto the death, even the death of the cross. Wow. He had a choice. And he chose what had been mapped out for him. You know, I like what the Amplified Bible says. This is so powerful. I like what the Amplified Bible says. It says, and I'm starting with verse 6. It said, who, although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained. You know, I, I think about this. He could have said, well, God, why don't we trade places? Uh, well, instead of the son go, why don't the father go? But when God, when, when, they, when, they, made, when they came up with this plan, they came up with this plan, they, they agreed that this is the way it's got to be. Verse 7, it says, but stripped himself of all the privileges, wow, and rightful dignity, so as to assume, as to assume, as to assume the, 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 uh, the guise of a servant or a slave, in that he became like men and was born a human being. Verse 8, and after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still further and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Now go back to what I said earlier. If you knew what your life was going to be like before you were born, and you knew that your life was going to be full of hardship,
and tragedy and even a brutal death. But yet you had the chance to change. What would you have done? Jesus knew. Just to think, Jesus made a deliberate decision to renounce the privileges of deity. You hear what I said? He renounced the privileges. I didn't say he was no longer God. I said he renounced the privileges that he had in heaven. By limiting himself to a human body and relinquishing his position in heaven in order to become a servant on earth, even to the point of death. Wow. This is an amazing story. This is an amazing story. If one person in history who ever had the right to, or to assert his rights and weighed them, yet because he cared about the human plight more than he did his own plight. He gave up the independence use of his attributes to serve those he loved. And this is why the first Christmas came about. He came. He came. He gave up all his rights. He gave up all of his privileges because he was thinking about Michael Nelson. He was thinking about Connie Peterson. He was thinking about Michelle. He was thinking about, he was thinking about April. He was thinking about Rolene Coleman. He was thinking about all of us. I'm just overwhelmed with this story. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter, um, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. Would you say Emmanuel? God with us. Hmm. Now, there's a story that kind of illustrates this long ago. It illustrates this long ago. Hallelujah. There ruled in Persia a wise and good king. He loved his people. He wanted to know how they lived. And so in order to want to know how they lived, because he was born in royalty, he wanted to know about their hardships. And often he would dress in the clothes of a working man or a beggar, and he would sneak out from his kingdom, and he went to different homes. And on one occasion, he went to this home of a poor man. No one whom he visited thought that he was their ruler because he disguised himself real well. One time he visited a very poor man who lived in a cellar. He ate the coarse food the poor man ate. He spoke cheerful, kind words to him, and then he left. Later, he visited the poor man again, and he disclosed his identity by saying, guess what? I am your king. I'm your king. Now, the king thought the man would surely ask for some gift or favor, but he didn't. Instead, this man said, you left your place and your glory to visit me in this dark, dreary place. Oh, you ate the coarse food I ate. You brought gladness to my heart. To others, you have given your rich gift. To me, you have given yourself. You have given yourself. Think about this. 
God made man in the flesh was willing to make the most any accommodation to have fellowship with us. He went out of his way. He made sacrifices. He gave his life. He made all the accommodations for us because he wanted fellowship with us. He wanted fellowship with us. Oh, that brings me to my knees. I just got to give him a praise. Lord, I thank you. Oh, God, I thank you for the accommodations that you made. You paid a debt that you did not owe, and I owe the debt that I could not pay. Oh, God, thank you for the accommodations. Thank you for inconveniencing yourself so that I can be, I can experience your grace and your love and your mercy. Oh, God, I just want to praise you publicly. I want to thank you for this amazing story, God. I want to thank you for this amazing story. Think about it, the first Christmas. God made man in the flesh. Came as a helpless little baby. That was probably even breastfeeding. It had to be changed. Diapers. You know, I love the scripture over in, hallelujah, John chapter 1, verse 14. It says this, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Y'all got to say that. Come on, we got to say it three times. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Come on. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. One more time. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we know that that was Jesus. The living word. The living word. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Now, you know what? You could tr also translate it like this. He tabernacled amongst us. See, in the Old Testament, the Lord God made his dwelling in the midst of his people literally at the what? The tabernacle. The tent of meeting. The Lord did that. And he did that because that tabernacle was there that made his presence known among the people in order to meet with them, to interact with them. You see, the Lord tabernacle among them to God and to guide them, to give them his word, to forgive their sins through his appointed sacrifices, to lead them into the promised land, in short, to save them. That is how the Lord dealt with Israel, by tabernacling amongst them. Now John is saying, this is what happened on an even greater scale, on even a greater scale, when the word became flesh and he tabernacled amongst us. You see, God was present in the midst of fallen humanity in order to save us. The only son of the father, the glorious son of God from eternity, pitched his tent in the mist when he became flesh. And he did so full of grace and truth. You see, God's son was, only, was on a saving mission to redeem mankind. <laughs> to redeem mankind. all the things that I've done wrong, all the sinful ways that, all the sinful things that I have done, 
he had me in mind. He did it by becoming a man himself. That's what the little baby in the manger is all about. That's what Christmas is all about. The word becoming flesh in order to save us. Now I want to ask you a question. What does it mean to say God is with us? You know, we, we, we heard it a lot. What does that mean to say God is with us? The meaning of Christmas is that the creator of the universe has become a human being. It means that the terrifying God who appeared in the Old Testament as a whirlwind and a fire has become a vulnerable baby in order to be close to us. That's amazing. The God of the universe became one of us. And he says, even though for thousands of years you've been messing up, you've been doing wrong, but yet I'm going to make myself vulnerable and I'm going to allow this, 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 this poor Jewish girl by the name of Mary and her husband Joseph to take care of me. Wow. Keely used to sing the song all the way from heaven down. He came all the way from heaven down. Oh. Lord, I got to give him another praise before. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you. Lord, that you came all the way from heaven, God. All the way from heaven, God. With me in mind. You had me on your mind, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, for the word becoming flesh and dwelling amongst us. Thank you, Lord. Now, he did all of this. He did all of this. He made all the sacrifices. He knew what his life was going to be like. And I want to ask you a question. What in turn will we do in order to be close to him? What will we do to be close to him? He went through all of this so that he can be close to us. He went through all of that so that he could be close to us. He suffered. He bled. He died. He lived in poor circumstances. He didn't have a place to lay his head. He was spit upon. He was mocked. He was abused. He was on the run for his life because you know what happened after he was born and after about two years and the wise men, they came uh, uh, to visit him in the house, not at the stable. Okay? So the wise men were not there on Christmas Day. They showed up almost two years later when he was in the house and he was a baby. Okay, read it for yourself. Okay? But they gave him gold, they gave him frankincense, and they gave him marrow. Okay, you know what? Part of that would help them because the angel came to Joseph and told him to flee to Egypt because, you know, the, the, the king wanted to kill him. And guess what? God made provision for him. He is, he's on the run. Run for his life, even as a baby. And I'm asking you, God went through all of these changes. Sometimes we just say, God, you don't know what I'm going through. God, you don't know my pain. Oh, God, why you let me go through all this? And God said, I went through the ultimate. Would you like to trade places? And yet, you don't understand that, as I say, God knows you. He sees you. And he's for you. But yet we sometimes don't act 
like that. What are you doing to be close to him? Not only that, but he came to meet our greatest need. Our greatest need had nothing to do with the physical, but our greatest need is, to fulfill, is fulfilled because Jesus is with us. That was my greatest need. I want y'all to think about this because I got this quote. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a savior. Woo! I needed to be forgiven. Are y'all hearing me? Come on, y'all need to stand for that. That's something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you can, hallelujah. Come on, let's just praise the Lord. Come on, let's just take time to give him a praise break. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I needed to be forgiven, God. I needed to be forgiven of my sin. Thank you, Lord, that you look beyond my fault and you saw my need. Woo! My greatest need was to be forgiven. So God sent us a Savior. Woo! You can be seated. Look what it says here in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which should be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. I think about that song, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, oh, happy day. When Jesus was what? Born, or when he was, hallelujah, he washed my what? He washed my sins away. Oh, when he was born, amen, it was a what? It was a happy day. It was a happy day. Hallelujah, it was a happy day. It was a happy day. Not a happy day for him, but it was a happy day for us. Boy, this is the great, this is an amazing story. An amazing story. Now, guess what? I have direct access to him. In the Old Testament, they had to go through the priests. Amen. But now I have direct access to him. Direct access to the Father. Imagine, I want y'all to think about this. Imagine trying to make an appointment with the President of the United States of America. You're t you telephone the White House and you tell them, look, I'm an American citizen and that I have a, I, I, I have a beef to, to, with the President and I would like to make an appointment so that I can tell him how I feel. And then the question would come quick and fast. Who are you? Where are you from? And what's the nature of your inquiry? Can anyone else help you? He's very busy. <laughs> and then you say, I know he's busy. But I need to speak to him. You're not going to get through. But I want you all to think about this. This is so powerful. What if you were the president's son or daughter and you call? Guess what? That's not the kind of response that you're going to get. Guess what? They say, oh, this is the president's son or daughter. Okay, okay, uh, Mr. President, your son or daughter is on the phone. Uh, put him through. Put him through. You see, his kids can ring up and just say, hey, Dad, I'll be there in five minutes. His kids. You see what I'm saying? I'll be there in five minutes because to them he's not, he's not the president. His dad what? Their dad. Amen? I'm going to pop in and I'm going to see you. 
I'm going to pop it. Okay, son, come on in. Come on into the over office. Come on in. I'll be waiting for you. See, that's the kind of access we have with God. We have that kind of access to God, amen, any time of day, any time of night, in the wee hours of the morning, in the afternoon hour. He's never too busy. He's always ready to have closeness and to have fellowship and to hear what's going on with us. And not only to hear what's going on with us, but he even wants to talk to us if we can just stop being so busy and just, just be, or just take time to just stop and say, God, let me enjoy being in your presence. Now, let me close with this aspect of Jesus with us as a friend. <laughs> God made man in the flesh. He came down, and when he did all this, when he, when he made his covenant with us, you know what he said? He said, not only you're my brother, but, you know, you're like a friend to me. A close friend to me. Y'all don't believe that? Look, look what it says here. This is so powerful. John 15, 15. Look what it says. I, I, I love this. This is Jesus. He says, I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know what his master, what, what, what's his master's business. Who, he says, instead, I call you friend. I, I got to marinate on that. <laughs> Jesus said, I call you friend. I call you friend. And then it, it, then it says this. I call you friends for everything that I've learned from the Father I have made known to you. He said the secrets of heaven that I've learned, that I know about, that I created, guess what? I'm making them known to you. You see, the God with us of the first Christmas lets us know that we are not failures with him as our friend. You are not a failure. You are not a mistake. You understand? Amen. Hallelujah. Your friend says you're not a failure. Your friend says you're not a mistake. Your friend doesn't hold grudges against you, even though we have done things wrong to God or made promises to God that we haven't kept. He says, no, no. No, I want you to know today, if you're listening to me, you are not a failure. You can make it right with God. There's absolutely nothing that you could have done that God can't make it right in your life. Stop holding on to things that God never created you to hold on to. He calls you friend. And he says, I came so that you can live. You can live life and live it more abundantly. Now, in the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, the angel Clarence said this, and this is a powerful statement. I love this. This got me through my depression. I'm serious. When I saw that movie, A Wonderful Life, that's why I love it. I watch it every year. Uh, they, they, at one time, it was voted the, the best movie of all time. I don't know if some of you haven't seen it, but if you hadn't, this, you need to, you know, get it and watch It's a Wonderful Life. But this is what the angel Clarence said. He says, remember, no man is a failure if he has a friend. No man is a failure who has a friend. See, God can never be in want. Did you hear what I said? God can never be in want because he possesses all things. So his friend could never be destitute because God, our friend, 
is with us. He knows us. He sees us. And he's for us. Now, let me close with this. Let me show you what God did for us as a friend. I want to illustrate it because you need, you know, we need everyday things that we can relate to. Okay, let me illustrate this for you as I close. Now, during the reign of Queen Victoria, a London doctor visited a 72-year-old woman named Martha Benson. Her husband had abandoned her some years earlier. She was poor and lived in very humble surroundings. She was undernourished and had neither warm clothes or wood or fire. The doctor couldn't believe her friend, her friends would allow her to live like that. They just couldn't believe that. So he asked about it. Maria or Martha, he said, or, or he, he asked her, where are your friends? And she said to him, I don't have no friend. Later in the discussion, she corrected herself and she thought back. She admitted that there might be one, but was not sure she had forgotten about her. The doctor pressed her for the identity of the friend. And finally, Martha told him that it was the queen herself. She said that the two of them had been childhood friends. The doctor left not sure what to believe. But when he got home, he went and he wrote to the queen a letter relating the incident. A few days later, he received a letter from the queen. The story was true. The queen had not forgotten. And closed in the letter, was enough money to provide the poor lady with all of her needs. For the remaining years of her life, the poor lady lived comfortably as a friend of the queen. We have a king the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am, the alpha, the omega, the first, the last, the beginning, the end, who is, who was, who is to come. Who's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us even now. So that I could be forgiven and I could have life and I could have it more abundantly. <laughs> woo! 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 Hallelujah. The greatest story. I told you a great story. Now the question is, what are you going to do with that story? What are you going to do with that story? What are you going to do with that story?